We're going to spend this Locked on Huskers talking about Greenback Tennessee's finest, Marcus Satterfield. You are Locked on Huskers, your daily podcast on the Nebraska Cornhuskers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, gang, GP here, Locked on Huskers from... 937 the ticket and Lincoln America. We thank you for making Lockdown Huskers your first watch. Listen each and every single day. Uh, this episode brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, you can see all of that information right there. FanDuel.com slash lockdown. Make every moment more. Lots of props, lots of lines to bet. We're headed into a new season. Uh, you're getting ready for March Madness and preparation over who you're going to have in your pools and who you're going to have in your brackets, well, go to FanDuel.com, hit slash lockdown for discounts, but it'll also let you know where you should sit, put your mind, and where you should put your head when it comes to college basketball along the way. I wanted to spend this particular episode talking about uh, probably the second most important uh joining of the program the the signing that that will resonate the most offense here in lincoln nebraska and under the guidance and tutelage and and leadership of matt rule the selection of an offensive coordinator is important so over the course of this we'll go through kind of what his personality makeup and profile is and then we'll go through his history and some of the things that he's accomplished in that time we'll do that over the course of the episode again feel free put your comments down in the comment section let me know that you're watching listening and if you have questions things you want us to cover in future episodes and we'll have plenty for you uh throughout the course of the month and then leading up to spring game april 22nd april 22nd so we're on the short clock um for for spring game here in lincoln nebraska i'm expecting the whispers are somewhere in the expectation of uh, 70,000 plus for spring game happens with the new coaching staff and new leadership, new players, uh, new blood uh, in the space. Good for them. Um, and we will follow it and take you through it as much as possible. Marcus Satterfield, again, uh, Satterfield was born in uh, Greenback, Tennessee. And as a, as a, as a pretty uh, successful athlete, a wide receiver in college, uh, i I want to say 100 plus catches over the course. As a matter of fact, 124 catches uh, in his career, uh, and then being a student of the game and being willing to put in the work, which is if you want to, you know, the boxes that you need to check for a successful coach, uh, a, six, a successful assistant, uh, successful coordinator, and then head coach. Those four things: hard work. And not being outworked is a vital cog. It is a box that has to be checked right away. And in in the in the in the history that is uh, Marcus Satterfield, Satterfield, he's put in the work. Now, let's go through some of what uh, we know. Uh, I was a graduate assistant in uh, Chattanooga uh, back in 1999 and uh, the year 2000. Stayed there and then became the wide receivers coach. Uh, in 2001. Big leap, a lot of responsibility, good work, and when you have success, then he moves over, goes to Tennessee uh, in in 2002 and 2003 as a graduate assistant. Uh, Then became uh, the wide receivers coach for the Richmond Spiders. Uh, Stayed there for a year. Moved to Western Carolina also as the receivers coach. And I'll I'll ask you to pay attention to how fluid he moves and transitions from one location to the other. It says whatever you want it to say, but to put in play and and, and to have it in your mind that he's able to adjust, but also he's very quick to to transition and move to a new new position at a new location. 2006 and 2007, University of Tennessee, Martin, as the offensive coordinator. And again, that's a jump from being a receiver's coach at three uh, institutions and then being the offensive coordinator at UT Martin. Now, in 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 Tennessee, with the Vols being 
uh, the program that everybody has eyes to. And then having Memphis uh, with all the athletes uh, in that area that you can work from. Um, yeah, the offensive coordinator is a position of power, but also just sets the tone for who these teams were. These were teams, and we'll go a little bit further into it in the next segment, but these are teams that wanted to run the ball as a focus and then throw the ball and take big big risk, big chances, stretch the field, get vertical. Uh, he became the associate head coach and the passing coordinator, uh, passing game coordinator in 2008. Uh, then moved to uh, Tennessee Chattanooga as the offensive coordinator in 2009. He was there until 2012. Um, good results when it comes to the scheme itself, the scheme itself and the development of players. Uh, successful. And you know it's successful because after three years, he leaves Tennessee Chattanooga and goes to Temple on the same scope and in, in, under the same leadership of Matt Rule. He's the offensive coordinator and the quarterback's coach, and he bounced between being a recruiting coordinator co and, a, and, a, and a group coach at several of these places. So being able to identify talent, develop talent, and then get talent to execute under his leadership. The most time spent anywhere in his career at, at Temple. 13 and 14 as offensive coordinator, quarterbacks coach, and then 15, uh, 2015 became the core offensive coordinator and the running backs coach. Now, he spent time as an offensive line coach, tight ends coach, receivers coach, quarterback coach, tight end coach. Checked all the boxes for having an understanding and a familiarity with the talent required for each uh, position and each group, the talent required and development required for each system that he wants to use. And where you are affects the system that you run. Very few offensive coordinators go through this and run the same thing everywhere because it becomes trackable. The tendencies start to show up and people know how to defend it. But being that he understands all of the, the, the groups on offense, he's helpful to an assistant coach and to the defensive coordinator because he can be flexible in how they attack folks and then how they plan uh, to defend folks on the other side of the ball. And developing of players in all of those groups, if something's not working, a coach who has coached all of those groups knows how to identify which group needs assistance, and improvement. He leaves Temple in 2015 and becomes the head coach at Tennessee Tech. There for two years, again, all of those offensive boxes checked at a high level at Temple. You then take the head coaching job two years at Tennessee Tech, and you're there until that rule goes to Baylor. And in 2018 and 2019, he becomes the tight end coach for the Baylor Bears. Very specific in the area of need, in the style of play, in the conference they were playing in. And to change the way they attacked folks was through the tight end position, flexibility, fluidity, and being able to both run and block with the people at those positions. Then he popped over to the Carolina Panthers as the assistant offensive line coach, and then to South Carolina uh, a year later <laughs> as the offensive coordinator and quarterback coach. There's a lot to digest there, <laughs> and that's on purpose. I wanted you to know there's a lot in play, All right? We'll throw a break there. Again, once we'll thank the folks uh, from, from Locked On College Basketball. You're making Locked On Huskers your first uh, watch and listen of the day. Your second should be Locked On College Basketball. If you're a fan, follow this. They will give you the best. Uh, on 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 the court and off uh, breakdown, they'll introduce you some quality players and coaches, uh, the best in the business. You can follow that on Locked On College Basketball, YouTube, or whatever way you consume your podcast. More Locked On Huskers. Welcome back to Locked On Huskers. I'm Derek Pearson again. Around. Thank you for making Locked On Huskers your first watch and listen each and every single day. I want to thank the folks, the official sponsors 
uh, of Locked on Huskers, FanDuel. And you can jump on uh, Make Every Moment Count, FanDuel.com slash Locked on, codes at, 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 at activation, all good. Go and get yourself prepared for March Madness. That's what I would say. Or maybe even take a peek at the XFL that starts Saturday and Sunday. Maybe there's some action for you there as well. We were talking about new Nebraska football offensive coordinator, Marcus Satterfield, and went through his journey through being a uh, a group coach at every position, every position on the offense. And the understanding that's required, sometimes you, you changes happen because you're doing well. And sometimes changes happen because you're not doing well. <laughs> Pay attention to the quickness and, the, and, and, and how easily he moves from one location to the, to the next. In a perfect world, he comes here as the offensive coordinator and he stays because of success. That's in a perfect world. In the best world, he has immediate success as an offensive coordinator native here at the University of Nebraska. And if he has that set sort of success, he's not going to be here long either. A thing to ponder when you're at the coordinator position that somebody that knows You've coached quarterbacks, running backs, tight ends, receivers, and offensive line. You coach the offensive line as an assistant in the NFL. And that was kind of a learning situation. A classroom often is, is, is in the news place that you work. And he got smarter at Carolina. And then he went to South Carolina. And, you know, the difference between being an offensive line assistant for the Carolina Panthers and being an offensive coordinator in South Carolina, different levels of responsibility and also different conversations. A big part of his transition and adjustment at the University of Nebraska is sharing the known language that he speaks in to Matt Rule and to the other assistants that he's coached with and getting that language to the new roster what currently exists in this space and haven't been in those kind of spaces what i'll tell you happens is the common shared language and we call that shared iq knowledge of a set uh, of a set thing versus and and the addition of the language that moves said 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 room and technique between the coaches they share a common language and it's different than any other group of people talking together, speaking together. The verbiage and trying to get people to move from one place to another, to change the way uh, they move, uh, to identify and acknowledge the understanding of the, of the language being shared with them. The coaches, having coached together for long periods of time in different places, share in a, a language. But Casey Thompson has to re, has to learn a new language for the fifth time in four years. Some of it will be shared because it will be a thing that he heard at Texas or that he heard somewhere else, or some of the verbiage may be things that he uh, that he heard last year. But he's going to have to learn a, an entirely new language. The same can be said for Jeff Sims, who was at Georgia Tech and a very uh, the system that Georgia Tech ran, while similar to what Marcus Satterfield asked of his quarterbacks, still has a different verbiage, code words they speak. So coaches speak in two different ways. You have the one volume that is the teacher educator where you're doing an install and you break things down into specifics versus live action Live activity, short verbiage, keywords that a receiver understands to adjust his rap, or a quarterback understands the key focus on this play is a single high safety versus what looks like a cover two. And 
The coordinator can identify what this is. He needs to relay this information in short time with the fewest number of words and have Jeff Sims and Casey Thompson understand, both understand exactly the same thing and then communicate that to the other 10 players on the field with 60 to 90,000 people yelling at you and an angry, snarling defense across from you. The biggest transition for Marcus Satterfield will be teaching this new language, this new verbiage, these new key words to an entire a running back's room. Look, it's an entirely different leadership for that. Wide receivers. If the run game will be the focus and a priority, being able to communicate, teach, install, develop, run blocking receivers, a thing that Nebraska fans of the past will be very familiar with, may be unfamiliar and new to today's speed burner, former track athlete, go deep and outrun coverage receiver. And can you communicate those things in a short space on a consistent level at the Big Ten, Nebraska at its best level? Satterfield is a professional coach. He is a professional teacher. Very good at those things. He is very direct. And sidebar, I'm slightly more than curious about what his engagements and conversations are going to be with local media here. Why? Because he knows what he wants. He knows what he's attempting to do. He's very clear about what he expects. Then it becomes a matter of execution and acceptance of those things by the people in his charge. The relationship that he builds over the course of the next couple of months with Casey Thompson and and Jeff Sims and <laughs> Brock Purdy and Logan Smothers, yeah. And the other thing is he is not paying the debts of coaches past. So if he falls in love with Harburg, well, we've got a very interesting spring because he likes the big ball. Strong, powerful running game. And then when the def defense kind of lurks and, and leans in because they're, they're, they're facing friction and resistance at the line of scrimmage, then he'll stretch you with those sprinters that he's been recruiting over the top and take his chances. And there's some quarterbacks on this roster that are better at throwing that big ball than others. But, hey, that's why we're here, to watch all this stuff play out Take the journey and have the conversations so that you know what to look for and what you're hearing over the course of the next couple of months leading up to April 22nd, spring game, Memorial Stadium, uh, red versus white. We'll toward the break here. When we come back, we'll finish out this episode of Locked on Huskers. Be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for making Locked on Huskers your first listen each and every single day. Greatly appreciate you spending this time with us again today. We'll do it again tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about some of the new players that have been added to the roster as well. Um, I kind of want to focus on the offensive line tomorrow. Uh, there's some folks, three new additions that we want to talk about tomorrow, guys that have been brought to town to change, guys who have experience and are brought in. And um looking forward to that conversation tomorrow. Again, we'll thank the folks from FanDuel Sportsbook for doing what they do and allowing us to bring this content to you each and every single day. Make every moment more at FanDuel.com slash locked on for discounts. Go get to it. Um, to close is this. Uh, as we head to March Madness, Fred Hoiberg had a, had a night. And he's, this is the second consecutive rock-solid performance for the Husker basketball team. Uh, seven Down 17 against Wisconsin at home. Coming back, getting the game to overtime, and then winning on a 12-2 run in overtime. Box checked. 
well done, great performance. And then you go on the road in one of the toughest buildings in the Big Ten Conference. You go to Rutgers and you stifle the crowd. You absolutely silence them. You have them sitting on their hands uncomfortably because Nebraska started well. They started strong. They stayed collected. They stayed connected. And then each player contributed. All five starters contributed at a high level in exactly the way that they've been asked to do. Casey Tamanaga with his fourth straight 20-point-plus effort. Bravo. It's Casey's world, we're just living in it. Like Then C.J. Wilcher, who has struggled offensively, on fire, 5-3, 17 points in his home, in his home state of New Jersey. Marcus Lawrence also playing in New Jersey, his hometown in Plainfield, New Jersey, and having a night. And this is bravo to them. And then Sam Greasel giving you 12 points and 11 rebounds and five assists and doing uh, everything in his bag, running the offense, running the press break. And then Derek Walker giving you his 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 double digit full leadership point point center in the press break, and then being rock solid defensively. Huskers improved to 13 and 14, 6 and 10 in conference. And without, without noticing this thing, there are a couple of games, a couple of big wins from not playing that early end game. They have a chance to move up, and it's entirely up to them because they'll play the next two games here at PBA. They face Maryland on Saturday. We'll bring that, uh, that locked on Huskers uh, today. We'll bring that to you then, and we'll let you know how it went. Speaking of basketball, uh, in closing, again, thanks for watching Locked on Huskers or making it your first watch of the day. First listen, uh, jump over to Locked on College Basketball. Uh, do it on YouTube. It's where you or whatever way you consume your podcast. But it will take you through, vital to take you through this year's March Madness, through this year's Big Ten Tournament. Um, they'll break it down for you and let you know where to get your eyes and where to get your focus and where to get your attention. They'll let you know what's happening on the floor and off, not only in the Big Ten, but in the in the entire NCAA tournament. So do that. You'll be proud of it. But all of that is available to you on YouTube or however you consume your podcast. We'll close this episode once again with the three words we hear love so much. Go Big Red.